thank you, Dr. Santos, uh, for this privilege of sharing my ideas. Uh, these are actually ideas from old physics, vector analysis, the use of vector analysis in uh, understanding kinematics. So let me share my my contemplations on kinematics. I submitted a paper to the journal, Philippine Journal of Material Science and Nanotechnology, uh, not this one. Uh, it's titled uh, Jolting Kinematics uh, in the Proper Frame. Exactly this one. I hope you can see my manuscript. May I confirm if my manuscript is visible, Dr. Yes. Santos? Yes, it's visible. Thank you. So, what do I mean by these words? Number one, uh, jolting, it's the root word is jolt. Jolt is the change in acceleration with respect to time. And uh, my paper uh, is all about why it is not being given enough attention in uh, early studies of kinematics because it's actually almost always there unless uh, there is a restriction like in the Galilean kinematics. And kinematics, of course, is uh, the first thing that you study in physics. Uh, when you talk about position, velocity, and acceleration, that's kinematics. It's the mathematical uh, study for describing motion. Okay? There are no masses and forces yet. You just uh, want to know where, how fast, and how the velocity is changing for a certain object that you're trying to describe, like maybe a projectile, uh, a planet in orbit around the sun, but you're not asking about gravity and the mass of these things. So that's kinematics. Uh, after kinematics, you can go to dynamics where you study the laws of motion. And the first thing that will happen is you will be introduced to mass in kilograms. But in kinematics, there is no mass. Uh, it's just the mathematics for the trajectory and the way the particles move in space with respect to time. The other word here that needs attention is the word proper. Okay, a frame is a frame of reference, a coordinate system. Okay, usually Cartesian or spherical polar coordinates. It's just a mathematical frame. But proper has a root in a special theory of relativity of Einstein. Uh, before Einstein, we didn't distinguish between proper and improper things because Time is universal in the Galilean physics, all the way to Newtonian physics, all the way to even many of the electrodynamic uh, uh, pioneers. They didn't believe that uh, there's something wrong with universal time assumption. But what is this universal time assumption? It means that everyone's uh, reckoning of time intervals is the same no matter how you move. Okay? And Einstein found out and showed the world that this is not a correct assumption. Einstein showed us that if you are in motion relative to another observer, then the time intervals that you measure are not the same. And as a consequence, space is also relative, just like time intervals, uh, space intervals are also relative. What is not changing uh, between inertial observers is the speed of light. That's the sacred thing, the ratio of distance, uh, over the time interval covered by light from whatever source, however it is moving, the speed is a constant of nature. It doesn't care how fast or how slow, or maybe you're at rest. The speed of light is the uh, 299, you know, 792, uh, 458 meter per second. That's, that's the, the definition of the speed of light. You cannot change that as long as you're in vacuum. You can slow it down in a material because some materials have permeability and permittivity of that material. Uh, if you multiply permeability and permittivity and then get its square root and then get its reciprocal, you will get the speed of light in that material. It's called the, uh, the speed of light in vacuum divided by the index of refraction. So this uh, paper is all about, it's a, uh, it's going back to the basics, but now uh, a different perspective, which is actually your perspective as an observer. You are a privileged uh, 
observer because no one else can be in your own frame of reference. No one else can look through your eyes. So you see the world in a in a very personal way. And unless a friend is really coincident with your eyesight, how do you do that? Uh, it's difficult. Maybe you have to wear uh, an electronic eyewear so that your view is the same as a uh, first person view of one person. And uh, you are also in the frame of reference of that person. So the proper frame is the frame where you measure proper time, proper coordinates, proper velocity, proper momentum, etc. It's the, the, the frame of reference where you are at rest. And so you're measuring uh, rest mass, rest, uh, rest uh, proper time, uh, rest energy. Everything is the proper quantity. Whereas if you are reading the, the, re the measurements of another observer who might be in relative motion to you, then those numbers are not yours. They are called improper observations. And this is the, the, the reason why uh, in this paper, I will set up a coordinate system in the proper frame because that's the only frame where you are personally measuring your own uh, numbers. Okay. Uh, uh, accounting for everything that you observe in the universe from your proper frame. If you want to understand the numbers measured by another observer, which might be in relative motion to you, then you will need a law of nature called Lorentz transformation equation so that those numbers can be translated to you and that will give you uh, a consistent conclusion about the nature of reality. And so there are none in there there are there are observers that are not proper observers because you are the proper observer in your frame of reference of course if you believe in the existence of the other observers then they they also have their own proper observations and you will be the one that is giving a number that needs to be transformed using the laws of nature so that it can agree with the numbers the numbers may not agree but the transformation is the one that is uh, universal and that's the one that physics is looking for things that do not depend on your frame of reference they are called invariants like the speed of light the speed of light does not depend on how you move that's an invariant it's the same in all inertial frames of reference like the proper time that's also an invariant because you have to be at rest in order to measure the proper time you have to use your own wristwatch your rest energy you have to be at rest before you can measure the rest energy your rest mass okay those things are uh, proper measurements and they are done in your proper frame of reference okay so that's the introduction <laughs> uh, next uh, so these are the topics uh, related topics that might be touched upon by this uh, simple research it's really more of a review than a research okay I will not read the material you can check the publication for more details here is uh, something that might be familiar to everyone who did kinematics up to the third term, okay? Because when you are, when you have the first term, this is called an infinite series, a Maclaurin uh, series, a special case of the Taylor series of the position x as a function of time. And if you were Galileo, you reached all the way to this uh, third term, one half acceleration times the square of time uh, so the position of something uh, with uniform acceleration is quadratic in time uh, of course uh, you will think of falling bodies okay for a falling body instead of x that will be y and except instead of acceleration here that will be the negative 9.8 meter per second squared if you are on the surface of the earth and that's almost all of Galilean physics the first term is the state of rest. If, if that's all you have, then that's your location forever. But if you have uh, a velocity, then you might move away with a constant velocity, or uh, you might move away with an increasing velocity. If you're really bored with a subject, maybe you can run away with an acceleration from the lecture. Uh, uh, the first one is called rest. The second one is called uniform motion, when there is no acceleration. The third one is called uniformly accelerated motion. I will just refer to as UAM. But what if there is a next term, which is the jolt? Okay, if there is a constant 
change in acceleration, then that will be uniformly jolted motion. That's not in the textbook, but uh, maybe they they have it somewhere in the research. And if that jolt is also changing with respect to time, meaning there is a there is a derivative of acceleration with respect to time, which is j, and evaluated at time zero, that's j naught. If that j is also changing in time, then we call that the jounce. And if that is a constant, we might call this the uniformly jounced motion. But it is seldom to see higher powers, higher than two in textbooks. So uh, that's the, one of the motivations of the paper. Why are we always neglecting, well, not always, but most of the time we neglect higher order terms in this uh, series. Well, of course, uh, simplicity says, uh, start with a symbol so that we can uh, deal with the complications later. Reality is not always this simple. Uh, most motions are not uniformly accelerated. If you fall from a satellite, okay, uh, if you are given no velocity at all, then you will fall with increasing magnitude of acceleration. As you go close to the Earth, uh, according to the universal of gravitation, the acceleration will behave as uh, reciprocal to the square of the distance from the center according to Newton's universal law of gravitation. When you are on the surface, you will get that 9.8 meter per second squared. But if you go under the ground, let's say at the depth of the uh, uh, Mariana Trench, which is 11 kilometers below the sea level, then don't use 9.8 there because some part of the crust and ocean is already outside your sphere. So not everything not all the matter of the planet is under your feet. Some part is above your head. 11 kilometers thick of the shell of the crust is above your head. So you don't include that and you use the Gauss law to, uh, to determine the acceleration due to gravity at, at depths like the uh, Mariana Trench or maybe the 3,800 uh, meter depth of the Titanic where recently uh, extreme pressure exploded. Uh, the titan okay that's an introduction here is an example of us of something with a jolt it's also known as a jerk by the way uh, if you differentiate these ones you will get a quadratic function okay? most of you have, you know calculus uh, 1 minus 3t squared is the derivative of this that would be the velocity of something that follows this uh, equation okay? this is not a galilean uniformly accelerated uh, equation. And acceleration is the second derivative of this. So in the first derivative, you had one minus three t squared. The next derivative, which is the acceleration, is not a constant. What will it be? The derivative of one is zero, and uh, negative three t squared becomes negative six t. That's not zero. That's not a uh, constant, okay? So it belongs to the, uh, non-uniform acceleration and therefore there is a next derivative which is the jerk or the jolt and the derivative of negative 60 is just negative 6 and the unit will be uh, distance over time to the third power so in this case this example because is a uh, a certain alien ship an alien ship is uh, approaching earth uh, from the past uh, x equals zero is the location of our planet, and the x-axis is where it comes from, from the positive x-axis. Uh, it got curious because it looks like this blue planet, a very interesting structure, so maybe there are, there are people who are interested in mathematics and physics. So they decided to, uh, to take another pass, okay? Uh, and, and uh, of course, they have to decelerate. Uh, turn around and look at planet Earth again. So there will be essentially uh, three visitations. Upon realizing that most Earthlings don't really like math, it, it decided to move on and never look back. Nevertheless, it left a message to a few mathematically curious Earthlings, uh, some of them are amongst you right now, stating this equation of motion is given by this cubic function. Uh, X here is measured in astronomical units. That is the average distance of our planet from the sun. That's about 1.5 times 10 to the 11 meters. And time is in years. 
Okay, so this is not meter per second uh, velocity. This is a uh, uh, astronomical unit per year. Okay, our planet makes a round trip around the sun in one year. So the radius of that uh, circle, it's almost a circle, is this number 1.5 times 10 to the 11. The circumference of our orbit which is approximated as a circle is this radius times 2 pi. So that's the, essentially that's this, if you divide that number 2 pi r by one year, that's the speed as we orbit around the sun, which is about uh, 30,000 uh, meters per second. Okay. So we are asked to find velocity acceleration jolt of this spaceship. And when did it uh, first pass Earth? Will it uh, visit us again? Well, okay, what times did it do so? Identify the turning points. Now, to make this story short, here are the differentiations. Velocity is uh, 1 minus 3 t squared, as you know. How to differentiate t minus t cubed? This is the first derivative. This is size for your vision. And if you differentiate 1 minus 3 t squared, this is a parabola, by the way, it's quadratic in time. Uh, the acceleration turns out to be a, a constant times time. So it's, it's like a straight line with a negative slope and zero y intercept. But there's one more derivative. If this were quadratic in the beginning, like in the Galilean physics, then there is no more jolt because a uniform acceleration will not have a derivative. So most of the time we have an early encounter with physics with zero jolt or zero jolt. That's why it's an obscure subject. Now, to answer the roots, where are the roots? Just set the x or the value of the position to zero uh, because at those roots, those are the uh, x-intercepts. Uh, remember, x equals zero is the location of our planet in this problem. So, yeah, you can factor out 1t. You can factor out the difference of two squares, and it will give you three roots and because time is measured in years negative one means a year ago they had a visitation a year ago when they got curious and then they decided to take one more look and that is now time equals zero they're taking another look now in the future one year later uh, because when you turn around of course you will overshoot the location because you have gained a backward velocity when you turn around so you have to uh, decelerate again, decrease your speed, and then move on on a turning point. And then one year later, you're at, uh, uh, at this location, uh, the other turning point. And after that, you never look back because it turns out that we are not populated by mathematically interested uh, creatures. That's what they're looking for. Okay? So now, uh, what about those turning points? The turning points, you set the velocity to zero. Just like when you're looking for the maximum height of a uh, projectile, okay? you set the y component of the velocity to zero. And you solve for time. That is the time that you have reached the turning point, just like the maximum height. In this case, there are two uh, extreme uh, positions because uh, there are two answers to a quadratic formula like that, or quadratic equation. And this is uh, 211 days ago. That's the first time they decided to turn around, okay, and to have another look. And then uh, the other time when they are exasperated, they are disappointed about uh, the lack of mathematics in this planet, 211 days later, they will decide to turn around again and never never return again so this is from from zero to infinity actually from zero to negative infinity that's uh, uh, their final decision but they left the equation for us to for some of us to appreciate you can also locate those uh, times when they pass by t minus and t plus those are the type turning times to find where the spaceship is at those times just substitute this to the original cubic equation and simplify and you will get about 0.38 of astronomical unit plus or minus graphically it's like this graphically uh the blue line is your cubic function of time and uh the derivative 
the velocity is the the parabola okay the parabola the turning points are the local extrema the local minimum and local maximum of the position you know that from calculus and that will coincide with the zero of the velocity so that's the uh, time intercept of this parabola which is the velocity that's uh, 0.577 of uh, a year and also the acceleration is uh, negative 60 this is a straight line with a negative slope that's why it's coming down like that and it has no y-intercept so it crosses the orbit now where is the jerk the jerk is not in this picture because it's so low it's at negative six if you believe in the scale of the vertical because the horizontal is time the vertical it could be x if you're looking at this curve could be v if you're looking at this parabola could be uh, acceleration if you're looking at this blue curve and it could be the jerk if you're just looking at the constant value of the y-axis and i can't draw it there because this is only up to negative 0.5 I will need a longer graph below, and that's way below that pink line there. That's the jerk at negative six. It's a constant jerk. That's what I mean by the title. It's a constant jerk, negative six. And because some of you are offended by the word jerk, let me use jolt. Constant jolt, right? Negative six. We, uh, astronomical unit per year cubed. That's the unit in this problem. Okay, so that's one example of a, a simplest example of a constant jolt. But actually, it's more common than you think. An oscillator is actually jolt, jolty. Because if you, if you solve the Hooke's force problem of this oscillating object on a frictionless table, uh, it turns out to be, okay, the force is negative kx, proportional to the displacement from origin and that is the acceleration if you solve this the solution is a combination of sine and cosine we all know that so uh, i'll skip the derivation uh, this is the uh, solution and that solution if you differentiate it two times you will get the acceleration with a negative constant in front so just as uh, given by the initial equation it says uh, the solution comes back after two differentiations okay second derivative of x is x again with a negative omega squared so sine of omega t and cosine of omega t can do the job in fact those are uh, the mathematical solutions but you have to determine the initial uh, value of the position and the velocity usually they're given now the point is that usually the discussion of this ends here I just check uh, any textbook in in even the uni university physics when they talk about the oscillator they end up with a uh, position velocity and acceleration nothing more nobody mentions uh, correct me if i'm wrong but nobody has mentioned that there is more derivative than just acceleration and let me show you the next one so yeah it's a conservative system the energy is conserved kinetic plus potential but here is the solution to that equation second derivative of x with respect to time is negative omega squared x we call that the simple harmonic oscillator the position is yeah that's the solution it will satisfy this equation if you differentiate it once you will get the velocity okay if you differentiate it again the miracle happens differentiate cosine it becomes negative sine the sine becomes cosine and if you factor out the negative omega squared, you, you arrive at the original value of x, okay, where we began. So, indeed, uh, the acceleration is proportional to x with an omega squared outside, the minus sign. But you, you don't have to stop there. You can differentiate this again, and the jolt does exist. It's proportional to the velocity, but it again it is in the opposite direction. And not only jolt, it also jounces, okay? Now, if you differentiate the velocity, uh, you will get, uh, if you, after simplification, that uh, the jounce is actually the same direction as the displacement. Okay? And this doesn't end here. You can go all the way beyond. Uh, in fact, there are other names of higher derivatives, which I have now, no, I have not memorized. I remember there's this pop 
cackle and <laughs> you can google the other words they're just higher derivatives okay now let's go to the proper frame now the proper frame is motivated by this okay. uh, there is a frame of reference maybe this is you can imagine it is the frame of reference a position at the center of the sun the origin is the center of mass of the solar system or the galaxy whatever it's the most inertial, okay? but you are not there. You are on Earth, okay? And in fact, you're on a rotating surface of the Earth. So it's a complicated frame of reference that you are uh, occupying. And this is the, the proper frame of reference. This is your velocity as measured by the uh, alien sitting on the sun. Okay? It's the frame of reference of the solar system. And this yellow arrow is your velocity as measured by this uh, improper observer because you are here. You're the proper observer in your own frame of reference. So this velocity is measured by this alien outside, maybe observing from the top of the sun. Don't worry about his ass. He has technology to survive the sun's uh, radiation. Anyway, uh, V is uh, the, the magnitude of the velocity times the direction V hat. So V hat is a unit vector. Okay? It has no units because it's a unit vector it has a magnitude one its purpose is to give the direction of that velocity the magnitude is already in the speed okay so all vectors will be uh decomposed into such uh unit vectors and their magnitude it's a natural thing to do now what about acceleration if the trajectory is curving there must be a centripetal acceleration and as well as tangential acceleration so generally, there are two components of the acceleration. We normally decompose it into the tangential component and the centripetal component. This is a, a standard even in, in many elementary textbooks. The tangential component is obtained by a scalar product with a unit vector along the velocity. Okay? So that's how you find the tangential component of a vector uh, parallel to, this is the component parallel to the velocity. Just sandwich it between the unit vector V and then take a scalar product with one of them. That's it. You will get tangential component of velocity. It is also the change in speed. If you're driving a car, this is the accelerator or the brakes. If this is negative, you're slowing down. If this is increasing in speed, then maybe you're uh, stepping on the accelerator harder. But this cannot change your direction. The, the component that changes the direction is the centripetal, the one that points to this uh, uh, instantaneous circle that oscillates this curve. Okay. Uh, this is called the oscillating circle. Uh, you, you can imagine that there is a circle of a certain radius, capital R, uh, and the center of that circle is the center of curvature of your trajectory. But this trajectory may not be along a plane. It might be twisting in three-dimensional space. That's why if I tell you that this is the direction, it's still not precisely given because there are many directions that are perpendicular to the velocity. Uh, you, can, uh, you can take any arrow perpendicular to the yellow arrow and any arrow there is perpendicular to the velocity. So we need one more information about the centripetal acceleration's direction. And that is obtained by taking the cross product of the acceleration, the original one, with the direction of the velocity. In other words, this A cross B. Okay? By the right-hand rule, it will point perpendicular to both acceleration and velocity. Okay? Right-hand rule is a cross product uh, direction. And this is the unit vector. So the magnitude of this is just the acceleration times the sine of the angle between these two vectors, which is not necessarily 90. Okay. So this is not necessarily a unit vector. Finally, when you take a cross product with uh, between this V, just the V, the V hat, and this uh, by vector, we call it a by vector because there are two vectors there, V hat cross A cross V hat takes you down here to the centripetal acceleration. And because uh, those two vectors are already at 90 degrees by definition of the cross product, then this vector here is actually the centripetal acceleration because it's multiplied by the angle between A 
and the tangential vector v hat. So this is indeed the centripetal acceleration. So I want you to see that to find the centripetal acceleration, all you have to do is sandwich the original acceleration between the unit vectors of the velocity, okay, and then form a triple cross product. Now, you might want to ask, why are there no parentheses there? I say what we first did was to take the cross product of A with B, and then we took the cross product of this B with A, that's the final answer. In fact, it doesn't matter if, if you group the V cross A first, and then take the cross product with B hat or you take the cross product of A cross B first and then perform this cross product with V hat because V, v and V are the same in this case. So the, uh, the backup rule doesn't care about it because it's symmetric. So that's a nice uh, a remembrance. Okay? I, I personally like this to remind me of how to find the acceleration, a centripetal component when you are in three-dimensional space. And whatever happens, it becomes V squared over the radius of curvature multiplied by the unit vector pointing to the center of this postulated circle. I think that's the essential content of my, my paper here. So that picture is summarized here. So it's a velocity, it's the acceleration, the unit vector along velocity, now, by the way, there is no component of the velocity that is perpendicular to the velocity. Velocity cannot do that. It cannot have a centripetal uh, component to the velocity because velocity is the way you move. And we move, we cannot move in two directions, okay? Uh, we can only move in the direction that we go. So there is no perpendicular component to our velocity. However, acceleration can do that. They can have uh, a component parallel to the velocity and another component that is perpendicular to the velocity as we have shown here. Obviously, what we will need for such an object is the cross product, okay? The so-called backup rule. It's a precious piece of identity that we use in theoretical physics in many places. When we discuss angular momentum, we need this so that we can derive the angular momentum of rigid bodies. So this is provable very quickly. Uh, first, you get the B cross C. And I hope everyone knows to, how to do that. And then when you have obtained the maybe Cartesian form of that, take another cross product with another vector A and simplify it. It will become this a very useful combination of, uh, of two vectors with new component scalars. So this is so much easier than the left-hand side. Because the left-hand side, you know what the cross product can be. I'll show you. This is the cross product of B and C in Cartesian form. Okay, or in matrix form. It's just another vector. But uh, whatever this is, it is perpendicular to both B and C. Okay, that's this portion here in the parentheses. Now you need another cross. So you will treat this as another vector with these uh, X, Y, and Z components, and you need a cross product with another vector. Here it is. Okay, so you will perform that uh, next cross product with A. With A. And so you use the same procedure, but A will substitute A, Y, A, C. Instead of, uh, instead of uh, the second term here, which is C, Z, it will be the Z component of B cross C, which is this one, etc. So after simplifying this and collecting birds of a feather, so to speak, adding and subtracting things, okay, you can uh, pause this later if you like. If you are interested in the math, but I will not bore you with the math. It becomes the simple relationship, which is the backup rule. And we will use this because we just found out that uh, to get this, the perpendicular component of a vector, just sandwich it between the unit vectors of the other vector. And this is what we need. And in particular, if A and C are the same, then the parenthesis is irrelevant. So we can do away with that uh, uh, superfluous parenthesis because first move what you do, uh, interchange a cross product gives you a negative sign. And then interchange the cross product within the parenthesis, another negative sign. Two negative signs become positive. Aba. <laughs> Aba doesn't care if there is a parenthesis here 
or a parenthesis in the first two. So let's just do away with it. That's why uh, in that picture, there is no parenthesis between A cross B and B cross A. Uh, Dr. Santos, how many more minutes do I have? Should I wrap up to the conclusions, uh, Dr. Santos? Yes, Dr. Santos. I'll just continue and uh, do this as quick as I can. Uh, so, what did I do in this paper? Well, application of that is, uh, remember a long time ago, you, you learned about gravity, okay? And it is inversely related to the distance squared, okay? Force of gravity. So, a cross product is actually available in the discussion of uh, angular momentum of anything moving in space. If you take the derivative of the momentum cross L, L is a cross product of position and momentum, this is a triple cross because momentum is mass times velocity. Angular momentum is uh, uh, R cross MB, you know, R cross MB, R cross P or R cross uh, reduced mass times velocity. Uh, so this is actually a, a MB cross R cross MV. Okay? It's very similar to what we were talking about, but the R here is surrounded by V. So just like a backup system, it can be uh, de decomposed into uh, a tangential and a centripetal component. That's very important. And if you follow this, uh, conclusion, okay, you, you derive this uh, completely, you will find out that this actually solves the Kepler problem. Uh, and I have a, yeah, that's the backup application somewhere in the solution. You probably notice this is a backup system. Okay. And with that, and if you place here the gravitational force, ah, the, the uh, that's, that R squared will cancel and this will be integrable both sides. And that means you have a derivative that becomes uh, uh, zero, okay? becomes zero, and that's uh, a conservation law. So it means that uh, the derivative of this P cross L, because R squared will cancel with the universal gravitational force, so it also has one over R squared. After canceling that, you can integrate both sides, okay? And you will get this popularly known eccentricity vector. It is a constant vector for for any planet or any satellite. It is one of the uh, uh, the vectors that we use to track the the orbit of planets and comets and and even the one-time visitors like Oumuamua. And that's the eccentricity vector that can be recast into uh, the orbit equation, the conic section so somewhere here. Uh, if you do it well, your calculus and your vector analysis, it is again the uh, the triple cross product and more, you will get the famous conic sections that determine the path of our planets, okay? And not just planets, but also comets and asteroids and even uh, orbiters that are just one-time visitors, okay? So it is all a consequence of this uh, Halley's question. When Haley asked Newton, what will be the orbit if uh, if the force is inversely related to the square root of the distance? Nobody can provide the mathematics during that time. So uh, Edmund Haley asked Newton. This is uh, about two decades after the 1665 uh, bubonic plague, by the way, similar to our situation right now after the pandemic. Newton was actually working on his gravitation and calculus uh, manuscript. Okay. Uh, because of this. And this is how we understand celestial dynamics right now. So if you want to be uh, a celestial physics, astrophysicist, then you should know that this uh, is the consequence of an inverse square law of gravity. And we, that, we did it with the uh, proper frame uh, kinematic approach. Okay, I hope, uh, yeah, that's the history now, 1860, 18, 1684 is uh, when these things were settled by Newton after the pandemic of 1665. And now we know that uh, Mars is orbiting in an elliptical orbit. We have some eccentricity as well. And 
that's our understanding of this. Dr. Santos, uh, should I wrap up or do you have do I have more time? Uh, I think uh, you have to wrap up. Okay. I'll I'll do this in two minutes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Finish it. Okay, thank you. So if you plot those uh, trajectories, okay, conic sections, uh, our planet orbits in almost a circular path. Okay, uh, it has zero eccentricity, almost zero. I think it's about 0 0.016. So it's unnoticeable. But imagine Kepler doing this with primitive data of, uh, of uh, his time, and he was able to determine the eccentricity of Mars from Earth, okay? If you will do this, you might probably look at the orbits from the perspective of the solar system already, looking above and, oh, I can see Mars and Earth and everything. But Kepler did it from Earth by triangulation and the data of Tycho Brahe. And he was able to determine the eccentricity of Mars. Amazing, guys. And uh, he didn't have any computer or calculator. And so the sacrilegious uh, claim that the orbits are not circular uh, is actually uh, proved by Kepler with his uh, planetary loss of motion. All right. Uh, so your proper frame is not just for this uh, system, but also useful for the future of our understanding of time. Because time, universal, when it's, uh, if you ask Newton and, and, and uh, even Kepler and even uh, uh, Galileo, and even everyone before... I, I, uh, before Einstein, before 1905 paper of special relativity, almost everyone believed, maybe a few guys like Poincaré do not, uh, uh, believe that the time is universal. It doesn't care how you are moving. But Einstein said, no, that's not right. What is not changing is the speed of light. Times dilate and lengths contract. And in fact, uh, about 11 years later, he even proved that the sun actually slows down time. More massive the object is, the more it slows down time. And these are now facts that we use every day for our navigation systems. If the time on the surface of the Earth, which is in stronger gravitational field, is not cor corrected by special and general relativity of Einstein, as measured by the GPS satellites, which are in low gravity and traveling fast, then we will miss our destination and maybe our vehicles will crash against each other if they follow their navigation apps. It uses general and special relativity because we are aging less than those satellites because they are in weaker gravitational field. So what's my point? My point is that your frame of reference is measuring proper time. If you are not in the vicinity of a strong gravitational field, the, the time measurement in your frame is not the same as the time measurement of someone close to the sun or close to a black hole. Okay, you've seen interstellar where the discrepancy in time near a black hole is so different from the time uh, at the location of his daughter who grew really old when they met again in comparison to the father astronaut who's still young. Time dilation can be caused by the presence of massive objects and also your velocity relative to the observer. My final point is this. What if you are so far away from the sources of gravity, outside the galaxies, between the galaxies, not even that, between the galaxy clusters, in the so-called super void, the biggest and coldest super void known to, uh, known to astrophysics right now is this region called the cold spot, the cold spot of the cosmic microwave background. It is just anomalously cold because there's so little galaxies there, so few galaxies. The name is Eridanus or Eridanus, whatever you pronounce it. The question is, what will time, how will time behave when you are in the void? If you are in the vicinity of uh, strong gravity like the sun, neutron stars, black holes, time slows down. What if you are so far away? How will time behave? Will it contract? Okay, and that's the question. That's the reason why I developed these uh, uh, equations here. This is uh, my frame of reference. The choice is 
tangential centripetal unit vector and the by vector that that is perpendicular to both of them. So this is the mutually perpendicular trihedral in the proper frame. How do they change in time? Well, uh, after doing the math, you will find that the jolt is everywhere. That's why I call it the jolting kinematics. And this sandwich of uh, the back up rule with wings, okay? If you want uh, the perpendicular component of the acceleration, sandwich it, sandwich it between the other vectors, unit vector, and then form a triple cross product, out comes the perpendicular component of that derivative. This seems to be a general relation because here is a conjecture. This one can be proven, okay? You can prove this for acceleration, and you can probably, I suppose, prove it for jerk, and so on, for jumps. This must be a law of nature, okay? And no one's mentioning this. I don't know, maybe I'm just not reading properly. But uh, to finally exit this uh, manuscript, here is the final equation of uh, the system. Differentiate those unit vectors, and they are not constants because they accompany you in your proper frame. And your proper frame is traversing the universe in its complicated trajectory. Uh, what is your trajectory right now? You are on a steep, you are on a spinning planet. So it's, do you think it's circular? No, because the planet is also orbiting the sun. So it's a curly orbit around the sun. But the sun is orbiting the center of the galaxy. It gets complicated, okay? So the proper frame is the only frame that's relevant to you. How do you communicate your measurements? You need these derivatives. And time there is a single universal time. The next step recommended for my undergraduate uh, advice is, is to differentiate with respect to proper and improper time. Thank you for your time and attention. Dr. Santos, tapos na po. Thank you, Dr. Rodolfo, for uh, sharing this uh, uh, important uh, uh, approach in understanding the behavior of Joel and its application to space. Are there any questions from our audience? Uh, maybe uh, we can ask our physics majors uh, to chat their questions or you can open your mic so you can ask a question to uh, Dr. Rodulpo. What do you think uh, are the other applications of this uh, Jolt equation? Can we, I uh, was thinking of the uh, electromagnetic uh, applications, like the drift velocities, and what do you think? Oh, of course, uh, uh, Dr. Santos, uh, this is still just the first step. This is still classical. The next step is to uh, distinguish between proper and improper time. And pagka nakapasok ka na sa special relativity, of course, electromagnetism is just Maxwell equations away because uh, Maxwell's equations are already relativistic in a special sense. So, nandiyan na siya. Ano, let's have, this is just the first step. Mm -hmm. So, ano pala to? This is a uh, continuing uh, research study on the study of jolt. <laughs> Yes, yeah, we, we have to recognize jolt as a natural part of kinematics. Just like velocity, acceleration, why stop there? Mm -hmm. The jolt is looking for attention also. And it's here. It's behaving as if, if it, it's behaving as if it obeys the same laws, the same mathematics that velocity and acceleration follow. Parang pareho lang sila eh. And maybe the Jones also does this. Actually, this is a, uh, you know, some of the things that, uh, uh, you know, phenomena should be part of uh, PCC's uh, goal is to understand uh, what is beyond what we know. So, Textbooks thank you. Textbooks are good, but yes. you can explore more. Thank you, Dr. Santos. Baka may tanong pa? Oo nga. Any questions from the audience? You can type your questions in the chat box. So, 
ganda to kasi uh, thank you for publishing with us. Uh, napapansin yung publication mo eh, from our journal. Yeah, it's good to ano to support our local publications. Yes. Kasi very consistent naman yung mm. and over the years, di ba? Very consistent yung record ng Philippine Journal of Science yeah. and Technology. Mahalaga yun sa journal eh. Mm. Walang bumi. Walang bumi. Volumes. Okay, so since there are no more questions, we'd like to thank you, Dr. Rodolfo, for uh, this uh, paper that you have submitted and also your presentation in the Philippine Journal of Material Science 2023. I would like to close the webinar presentation for this day. And uh, there, it, there will be a part two because uh, there will be other researchers who will be submitting soon. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to feature them this month, this July. Thank you very much and a good day to everybody.